study of photoluminescence began in the late 19th century with observations of fluorescence and phosphorescence. These findings led to practical applications like luminescence paint. Today, photoluminescence continues to evolve and influence the diverse field from material science to modern lighting technology. Imagine a bulb in your home. When you turn it on, the filament inside gets really hot and it starts glowing and gives off light. Now think about things that glow even without getting hot, like glow in the dark stickers or marker. These materials absorb energy and then releases its energy as light. Thus, a substance will emit light either by heating, example, a glowing hot amber or bulb, which is called incandescence. In some case, light emission without heating, for example, glowing materials, fireflies, some jellyfishes, etc. This is called luminescence. More examples of luminescence. First one is an example of quantum dot semiconductor. The second one is the luminescence from a jellyfish. The third one is tritium wash dial and the fourth example is from an OLED phone display. There are many types of luminescence which can be classified by the energy source which initiates the process. If the initiation is by the absorption of photon, it is called a photoluminescence. Or if it is by the bombardment of electrons, it is called a cathodoluminescence. If it is by the chemical reaction, it is called a chemiluminescence. Mechanoluminescence is initiated by mechanical action, whereas radioluminescence is initiated through the bombardment by ionizing radiation. If it is activated by heating, it is called thermoluminescence. And finally, if it is activated by the application of electric field, it is called electroluminescence. Many of these luminescence processes have important scientific and industrial applications, such as electroluminescence where the light is emitted upon the recombination of electron and holes. Hole means electron vacancy after applying an electric field across the material and is the operating principle behind light emitting diodes. The chemiluminescence is used in biological assays and is responsible for the glowing of glow sticks. In this video, we will focus on the photoluminescence which form the basis of a powerful spectroscopic techniques. Photoluminescence spectroscopy that is widely using in both industry and academia. In this video, we will talk more about photoluminescence spectra. Before going to the video, let me welcome all of you to our channel, Psychopal official YouTube channel. When an electromagnetic radiation incident on a matter, it may absorb some of its energy and excite the low energy level electron to high energy level or from ground state to excited state. This process is called absorption. A detailed video of absorption spectroscopy is already posted in our channel. If you didn't watch that, please watch that video. As the electron will not like to sit on the high energy level, it will try to come to the low energy level by emitting its energy in the form of radiation. This process is called emission or in another way, it is the process that is the recombination of an electron and an electron vacancy which is known as a hole. The emitted light corresponds to the energy difference between the ground state and excited state or from S1 to S0, this energy difference. This energy difference can be calculated by a photon energy equation with Eg is equal to Hc by lambda. Eg is the band gap in electron volt and H is the Planck constant which value is 6.626 into 10 raised to minus 34 joule seconds and C is the speed of light 3 into 10 raised to 8 meter per second. Lambda is the wavelength. The calculated energy at the PL peak represents the band gap energy of your material. Consider additional factors such as temperature dependence or defect states that might influence the PL spectrum and band gap determination. Let us check with some example. See, this is a PL spectra of a material called a perovskite. The PL maximum is at 790 nanometer. Now, based on the equation Eg is equal to Hc by lambda, we can calculate the band gap of perovskite material by substituting all the values in this equation. The resultant band gap is 1.57 electron volt, which is true based on the literature. 
is this method is always correct we can check what are the things we need to consider before calculating band gap from pl first one is direct or indirect band gap depending on the material the pl peak may correspond to either a direct or indirect band gap transition if the material has a direct band gap the pl peak directly reflects the band gap energy however for indirect band gaps additional calculations might be needed to account for the phonon involvement in this transition and the second one is exciton binding energy if there is a presence of exciton pl may not exactly match the band gap energy in this case subtracting the exciton binding energy from the pl peak energy can provide a more accurate result third one is the data quality and the calibration of the instrument correct peak identification is resulted only from a very good data and also without calibration the judgment of the pl maxima will be wrong so by keeping all these things in mind you can calculate the band gap energy from your pl let's move on to the basics of photoluminescence for that we need to recollect some terms electrons in a stable molecules always exist in pairs as molecules with unpaired electrons are extremely reactive and unstable electrons possess an intrinsic angular momentum known as spin electron can rotate clockwise or anti clockwise to the spin axis a pair of electron can exist in one of the two total spin state depending on the relative symmetry of the spins of the two electrons if the two spins are in an anti symmetric configuration the electron pair has a total spin of 0 while if they are in a symmetric configuration the pair has a total spin of s equal to 1 if the total spin is 0 which is known as singlet state if the electrons are in a symmetric configuration then the pair has a total spin of s equal to 1 which is known as triplet state thus the singlet state is electrons having anti symmetric configuration and the total spin is equal to s equal to 0 and in the triplet state they are in symmetric configuration and the pair has a total spin of s equal to 1 for singlet state s equal to 0 and for triplet state s equal to 1 coming to the jablonski diagram in this diagram you can see different energy level that is ground state and excited state in the ground state the molecular energies of electrons are constant and possess minimum value when an incident light falling on this material it absorb energy and a transition occurs to high energy level that is from first electronic or second electronic state this transition depends on the molecule and the incident light this process is known as absorption these electrons remains on the first electronic state s1 state for some time after this short time the electron return back to the ground state by emitting photons here the energy is released in the form of emission this process is called fluorescence the emitted energy is less than the absorption energy that is energy of s0 to s1 is greater than energy of s1 to s0 thus the emission wavelength is higher than the absorb this is the normal case there is another way called up conversion that may discuss later by measuring the fluorescence quantitative and qualitative analysis can be performed if the electron's transition is from first electronic singlet state to triplet state without going to ground state this transition is called inter system crossing the electrons will stay in that state for some time before relaxing to the ground state it will emit radiation and relax to ground state this transition is called phosphorescence thus fluorescence is the direct emission from s1 to s0 
typical time scale is 10 raised to 10 to 10 raised to 7 per second whereas phosphorescence is delayed emission from T1 to S0 that is electron moves from S1 to T1 and then to S0 that is why it is called delayed emission typical time range is 10 raised to 5 to 10 raised to minus 3 per second the fluorescence is prompt photoluminescence that occurs very shortly after photo excitation of a substance in picosecond to nanosecond time scale while the phosphorescence is long lived photoluminescence that continues long after the photo excitation has stopped usually uh, microsecond to thousands of seconds in some material the s1 and t1 levels are close in energy and strongly coupled a reversible inter-system crossing from T1 to S1 is therefore possible. Reverse inter-system crossing. This gives rise to a delayed S1 to S0 transition, which results in a PL at a time, time scale between fluorescence and phosphorescence, known as delayed fluorescence. It is otherwise known as thermally activated delayed fluorescence or TADF. Coming to the instrumentation of photoluminescence spectroscopy. The instrument used to measure fluorescence emission from a sample is called spectrofluorometer or fluorescence or photoluminescence spectrometer. For this spectrofluorometer, different manufacturers called different names. The layout of a typical steady state spectrofluorometer is shown here. The excitation side of a spectrofluorometer is equivalent to the spectrophotometer that is a light source and an excitation monochromator. Generally, xenon arc lamps are used as the light source as their high brightness is essential to measure the weak fluorescence emission. The sample is illuminated by the chosen excitation wavelength which causes it to fluorescent. The emission is collected by the emission monochromator which is oriented at 90 degree to the excitation monochromator and the selected wavelength reaches the detector. Generally, the detectors are photomultiplier tube. If you think this video is useful, please like, share and subscribe our channel. Thank you for watching.